thanks for inviting me to this uh, ask me anything conversation. <laughs> Um, I'm, really I'm, I'm, you know, bro, so we, we hope you're prepared for it, man. No, of course no, and that's why it's going to be fine, right? So, exactly, exactly. We will, we will start uh, with something easy first. Yeah. Okay, we'll start with the easy ones first. Also, uh, I love the fact that when we when we talk about security stuff, we kind of go into philosophical issues, <laughs> uh, which are really my thing. So I really. Uh, look forward to our conversation today. <laughs> okay, we'll try and like start off with some easy ones first, okay bro? Uh, maybe you guys, what you might want to tell the audience um, a little bit about uh, what have you guys been up to for the last one year? Because um, I'm guessing for most people staying at home, their jobs have changed, the entire world has changed, like nobody's flying anywhere anymore. And so what's new with, you know, with, with the bug bounty stuff, man? I mean, like, how, how are you guys been adapting to that and... How is it? Well, <clears throat> well, uh, this is an interesting question because it's a, it's a mixed bag, you know. Um, the pandemic, uh, on one hand, created a lot of issues, especially <laughs> logistic issues. We couldn't travel, we couldn't meet in person, we couldn't see people, attend to events, uh, sponsor events, and then go and, you know, um, have a face-to-face -face, uh, relationship with people, which in our field is extremely important. But, and you know this better than anyone, <laughs> because you organize one of the uh, of the best events uh, worldwide. Um, but on the other hand, people adapted very quickly to the new uh, work-from-home stuff especially in our field where basically that's what people do anyway so I would say that apart from the pleasure of meeting people in person that sometimes also helps to uh, create stronger relationships uh, the, the business for us worked uh, as usual and honestly I must say that we had more time uh, and therefore, we could focus on more things, and we did more things last year than in the previous year. So, as I said, it's a mixed bag. It's, as you said, the world has changed, <clears throat> and probably this change, at least to a certain degree, would be, would be permanent. It's difficult to think that we will go back exactly to where we were uh, one year and a half ago. Uh, but for us, it was not such a big trauma, you know? Hmm. Uh, not only that, but by freeing up time and resources, uh, we could focus also on something new or something different. So we took the chance to, you know, uh, think better because we were less in a hurry, less, you know, jumping from here and there, from one plane to another and so on. So. For me, uh, and this is, of course, just my personal experience of this, uh, of this tragedy, which is and was the pandemic. For me, in the end, it was uh, a time for thinking better and to plan and to do more. So hmm. that's but, my... I mean, point. With, when it comes to bug hunting, though, right? Like, I mean, in the past, I would guess that you would go and physically see the the bug hunter, right? As in like you would probably get some kind of like face-to-face -face discussion with them or how has that changed? I mean like we're talking about, you know, kind of expensive code, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> they are worth quite a lot if you're talking about zero Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But since this was something that didn't happen only to us, but happened to everybody mm -hmm. uh, in the world at the same time. So... Psychologically speaking, at first everyone was, was taken off guard by this problem. And then with uh, different speeds, people managed to find a compromise or a new approach to things. Um, I must say that I think we were very quick to adapt also mm. because we are used to work with researchers through our platform. The, 
so-called DRH, Vulnerability Research Hub. Therefore, uh, of course, it's nicer uh, sometimes to meet people in person, but some other times they don't even want to meet. So everything happens through the platform or through online channels anyway. So, right. So in your case, I mean, uh, with, uh, what with I friends, really it didn't really make much difference the, because you have the platform, right? So sorry, that makes what I really miss is the possibility. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Can you say again? Oh, no, I was saying that the, with CrowdFans, right? Like, so the fact that you guys have your uh, vulnerability platform, that makes a big difference, right? Because all of the communications can take place through the platform, which is secure. So it didn't uh, need to have a okay, face-to-face. So in, in my dreams, in my dreams, it's like that. In fact, it doesn't <laughs> happen. Some people prefer to contact us through other means. So we receive, uh, you know, uh, nuclear grade uh, proposals for <laughs> for assets on WhatsApp, and <clears throat> this is of course uh, cool. wrong, or basically uh, should be avoided. So, in our vision, the VRH is safe enough so that. Even if at the beginning, at the early stages of a negotiation, the part, the, the researcher can be anonymous. And this uh, anonymity is strongly enforced by the platform. Then if we go into a deeper conversation and we find uh, interested parties for acquiring that asset, then of course we will need to, to, um, to know each other better. Uh, if this happens through the platform, this happens in a relatively safe environment. And I'm saying relatively because, of course, nobody is 100% uh, secure nowadays, but we think it has a good enough level of, of security, anonymity, encryption, and, and so on. Um, when the contacts come from other channels, we try to bring them to the VRH. And sometimes we succeed, sometimes we don't. Um, of course, we cannot force people to talk with us only through the village. That would be wrong, uh, because of course we respect uh, everybody's uh, needs and 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 uh, you know approaches to opsec and to security. Uh, but yes, having the platform for us is a big advantage and. Especially during this past year and a half, uh, basically we had the same number of submissions as the, the previous years. Now this is super interesting wow. because you know if you go to uh, Hagen Box Amsterdam and you offer a super cool party and 500 people attend, and then they see you know the logo, they see the brand, they see you, blah blah. So maybe they would be attracted by by working or collaborating with us and maybe they will subscribe to the VRH and submit their research. <clears throat> this is how it worked before. Now, without being able to, to do these cool parties, unfortunately, or to be in person in these uh, events, more or less we received the same number of submissions. Hmm. Uh, because of course, of course, people they're working from home. People also researchers had a lot of time because they were in lockdown or they couldn't go out and, and so on. So I don't know. It's uh, for us really. Uh, I understand that we are in a very uh, niche, uh, very vertical and small uh, uh, field, uh, and that for the majority of others the impact of this uh, terrible health issue uh, global health issue was was uh, was very bad in our case we were already working from home we were already working remotely we were already using uh, the best possible tools uh, to you know connect and discuss and negotiate very sensitive things uh, so hmm. it wasn't such a big deal. Of course, everything has changed. I agree with you that uh, this is a huge, huge blow 
to the previous uh, state of things, to the previous um, world, so to speak. The simple fact that now we are having this conversation on Zoom instead than having it <laughs> face to face in a nice venue is also a consequence of that, right? But still, we want to do it. And so we, with uh, enough resilience and, uh, you know, uh, uh, enough um, creativity, we can overcome anything, especially in our field. Well, heck is, right? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? I mean, uh, for you, it was uh, definitely a different story, right? Uh, but um, yes, I think that we managed to find, uh, to adjust. And then we will see what happens in the next months. I'm confident that things will go back to normal, but the normal will be different uh, from before. And so, hey, bro, just coming back to like talking about bugs, right? And bug hunting in general, right? I would say that yeah. things have kind of like evolved. Wouldn't you say that in the earlier days, right? It'd be a one guy could probably find a significant exploit. But maybe today that's no longer the case because there's so many defense mechanisms in place that one person can't fuss everything under the sun, right? Absolutely, Are you seeing that? Yes, you you see, thing? what's happening is that this market is now <laughs> differentiating, uh, uh, depending on the class of target that we are talking about. So while before there were uh, so-called low-hanging fruits everywhere, so you could find them in mobile devices, in desktop PCs, server, uh, computers, and also in networking gear everywhere, it was more or less the same level of insecurity. But now we have to deal with um, a world where certain classes of devices uh, saw an Im impressive increase of their uh, security in the past two years, three years. Uh, because the vendors uh, finally, and, and I say finally, even if apparently it's against my, my own interest, but if I look at the interest of society as a whole, if security increases is a good thing. Huh? So I, I say, I always say that uh, luckily now some classes of targets, at least some of them are much more difficult to, to exploit uh, successfully and in a meaningful way, in an actionable way. But other classes of targets are still lagging behind. And I'm talking about all this, that, that crap, uh, IoT stuff, SCADA, uh, a lot of, um, uh, small home, um, small office, uh, home office, uh, networking gear, uh, you know, uh, IP cameras, all, there's, there's a, un a universe of broken objects everywhere. And this is getting worse. So while a few classes of targets improve their security significantly to a point where it's hard for a single researcher to find actionable uh, exploits, bugs, and then to exploit them in an actionable way. <clears throat> I mean, we know there are a few geniuses out there, but they are the exception. They are not the, the normal. Hmm? for the majority of people, is becoming extremely complicated in terms of knowledge required, skills, time, resources, including financial resources, and so on. But on many other classes of targets, the situation is still... The, the, the security posture of these uh, devices is still uh, terrible. And so what we see is that <clears throat> the, the, the interest is shifting from those devices who are very, very difficult to hack and to exploit nowadays to the others. Because in the end, from the point of view of an attacker, 
<clears throat> the, the, the attack surface is a very complex and huge surface that includes a lot of things. So uh, if an attacker cannot get your phone, they will get your uh, thermostat. <laughs> they will get your Wi-Fi router. <laughs> they will get your car. They will get your, um, you know, um, internet connected uh, scale <laughs> that will publish on Facebook your weight every day. And so we are, uh, we are really uh, uh, overwhelmed by the amount of crap that surrounds. Uh, I mean, in terms of digital crap that surrounds us. So are you actually seeing uh, an uptick in uh, expert writers focusing more on to embedded and IoT and also buyers? As in, are there enough buyers to, to justify the researcher changing their focus? As in, like, instead of looking at mobile, like look at the embedded space or look at SCADA because the, well, the we'll number see, one expert will live for much um, longer. So your window I must, I must give you also longer? Because? An answer, I must give you an answer which has two parts. The first answer, the first part is since we don't deal on purpose with the uh, development of cyber weapons, but we only deal with uh, uh, law enforcement and intelligence side of things. And when I say intelligence, I mean intelligence uh, gathering, not uh, sabotage, for example. So since we are not dealing with cyber weapons, most of this stuff that is being offered on the market nowadays, which relates to SCADA, IoT, and this kind of crappy products, uh, is not in scope with our uh, customers' uh, needs. So we don't really look into that. I mean, we keep track of things, but we don't deal with those kind of things. Uh, but. Since IoT and networking and, and SCADA systems can have many different applications and many different shapes and, and can also uh, be part of an attack surface for an intelligence activity, sometimes uh, there is a, not, not, let me say not sometimes, there is a growing interest in some of these devices or classes of devices because <clears throat> they can be used um, on the field to reach uh, certain goals. So to answer your question, there is not enough demand, at least in our field, from uh, for IoT and SCADA research. Uh, but sometimes we have uh, very interesting requests for very specific things. So, um, uh, even uh, recently, we were dealing with um, some amazing research in this field, uh, and um, and we found some interest from from the from the demand side, from from the buyers. Uh, but generally speaking. I think this is something that will develop more and more in the next years. So this shift will happen in the next two or three years when uh, the mobile uh, would be so difficult to, to exploit that it will become a liability and therefore it will lose its uh, attractive attractiveness, its uh, interest. Mm -hmm. um, so now we are like at the early stages of this uh, uh, shift. So, but if I understood correctly your question is, the thing is, how can we support these researchers which are uh, following their interests and researching things that are not uh, so interesting or so in demand. Well, of course, they can do this as a bug bounty. They can refer and disclose these bugs to vendors and they, or they can go to events and they can get a prize for disclosing a nasty bug on a IoT device. 
there's so many things that they can do. Uh, if they have something that they consider interesting, they can still talk to us. And we will tell them very honestly, look, this is something that doesn't fit with, uh, with, with our customer needs, or this is something that might be interesting. And then we can, we can, of course, uh, go deeper and, uh, and see what, what 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 is possible hmm? so let's just uh, make a hypothetical situation okay let's just say i'm the bug hunter right how much of the exploit do i need to disclose in order to get the discussion going because if i tell you too much <laughs> you could reproduce it and that's always always a fear right it's like, i don't want to tell you like too much yes i give you like a well there are moment, different approaches enough. on the market uh, someone is asking to see the code period and because of trust or because they have a very powerful leverage on the researcher. So they will say, if you want to work with us, send us the code and we will let you know. Uh, hmm. The way we are doing things is a little bit different. So basically, before we go into the uh, analysis and testing, of any code, we want to discuss the features, the coverage, the artifacts, the corner cases, uh, the affected versions and subversions, the possible use cases, and so on and so on uh, and so on, without having a, a complete description of the bug. Uh, also because it's not in our interest to steal the bugs from uh, researchers, you know. Sure, it's sure. not our... I mean, it would be bad in many ways. Uh, first of all, and this is obvious, this would be bad for our reputation, but it would also be bad because then we would put... A, we would need to put a lot of effort into uh, weaponizing a bug, and that's not what we do. Uh, so uh, it's not really uh, useful for us. Uh, I'm not talking about the ethical side of things, but of course, this is, uh, I give it for, 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 give, for, for granted. Um, so we discuss up to a point where we can understand if going further in the negotiation is useful or not. Because many times, you know, uh, the submission is super cool and you think, oh, wow, this is a nice asset. And then when you go deeper, you discover that it only works on Friday or, it, it, you know, it, it, it only works when you have full moon and, and, you know, because that, that's how it works. This is voodoo. Uh, this is uh, really black magic stuff. So. When you start to understand that there are too many exceptions or situations or problems from our point of view, this is already uh, a no-go because the application of this stuff is so sensitive that you cannot have uh, low reliability or very small coverage or artifacts or any other issue. So, um, as I also said in my ComSec track uh, talk, where, where I show the funnel uh, of our, let's say, the filter that we apply on all the submissions that we receive. And this slide shows that over 100 submissions, on average, five end up on the field. Hmm. So it's incredibly steep uh, funnel. Um, so and we don't need <coughs> to know about the details of the bug unless there is a clear decision to acquire that asset. Mm -hmm. And at that point, since we offer, we think that we are offering fair contracts, we offer uh, usually unless there is already a good relationship with the developer, 
we offer a, a advanced payment to see the code and then we test it and then if all the tests are mm, successful we will um, finalize the contract and, and at that point there will be a certain way of, of paying which depends on the negotiation. So in any case when we reach the this conclusion that this asset is uh, extremely valuable and interesting and fits all our uh, uh, requirements then at that point is basically almost done so we can afford to give uh, an advanced payment to see the code so that the researcher knows that we are committing ourselves to uh, successful mm. um, to closing successfully the deal and then we test we discuss we see if there are problems and so on and so on until we uh, finish the test and approve in such a case then we sign and and everything uh, then moves uh, from there very smoothly so um people don't have to disclose their bugs and for those researchers who are listening now i advise you to not show your stuff to anyone uh, uh because we see many times that maybe we receive the same submission from different sides and and the original researcher is just one of them so uh, be careful mm -hmm. guys don't show your stuff around don't brag about it with your friends and colleagues uh <laughs> be careful because if you have something valuable you don't want to to leak it uh, you don't want to lose control over it. What about a uh, window of exploitability? So let's just say if I found a bug, like, do I have to guarantee that it's going to be remain exploitable after you guys have done your evaluation? Because what happens if the vendor patches it? Do I still get paid or tough luck? Of course, <laughs> but this is, of course. So during the tests, uh, basically, let me, let me use a metaphor, uh, Dylan. It's like we are buying uh, vegetables. Okay. <laughs> okay. But we're fresh vegetables without having a fridge. Okay. So the lifespan of these things is by nature unpredictable and usually short. Okay. Then there are some ways that we apply to make them live longer. This is part of our... I would say risk management and uh, portfolio management activities. Uh, and in the end, it works. We can say that by using this, this way of doing things, we can extend the lifespan, the shelf life of this, of these vegetables, uh, <laughs> a little bit longer. Okay. But still, we are talking about something that is ephemeral by, by nature. So, if it is patched while we are discussing and or testing, then in the, in the, in the, in the worst case for us, the developer will, will have received the advance payment for seeing the code and testing it. And that's it. Okay. I mean, unless someone from the, from the customer side is interested in a end day version of the same. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course the price will change and many things will be different. The, the, the possibility to <laughs> effectively deploy the asset on the field will be reduced and so on. Also, it will be less stealth. Uh, because it's, it's an end day, so it, it is known. And therefore, for many reasons, the, the fields of application of this asset will be, uh, dramatically reduced. And therefore, also the, the value will be, will be much less. But maybe it is still possible to close the deal. In many cases, it's not. Uh, to give you an example. Uh, let's say we're talking about, a RC for a major browser. Uh, if it's patched and that thing is, uh, 
updated automatically. Uh, after one week, it is completely useful, useless. So, mm -hmm. so in that case, there is no even the chance to use it as a name day. Uh, and therefore it's gone. But, uh, other things which have a long patching, um, windows, mm -hmm. or, or maybe the patch is released and people don't apply it for some reason. No. Uh, for those <laughs> things, there is still hope, so to speak. Now, what happens if it is patched the, the deck, the day after we buy? <laughs> then we are, uh, we are screwed, basically. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's our, it's our business, right? It is, is, these are the risks that we, that we have to take. So if this happens, what can we do? What can you do? Exactly. There's nothing is we there can do. Of course, we will not, you know, in this case, some people would scramble to sell it on, you know, in the, in the dark alleys. Uh, to uh, recover at least, at least uh, some money, uh, but that's not what we do. We don't do that. So in that case, it's a loss. <laughs> it's a loss. It's a loss for both sides. Unfortunately, uh, the researcher would have been paid for the advance payment that we pay for for reviewing the and testing the code, and we would have lost that, and we will not. And, but if we sign already, he would be paid, of course. That's How often in the past has that happened? As in that, uh, you know, one day after you guys, or okay, maybe not one day, but a couple of days after you guys have acquired the... No, no, it never happened. The exploit? Actually, they got fortunately, passed. fortunately, it never happened like that. Maybe sometimes a very nice asset had a shorter life than, that, than what we expected. Maybe after one month, it was gone. Mm. Okay. And, but you have to consider one thing that these government organizations, which are, uh, deploying this, this, uh, assets integrated into platforms usually, um, they're not usually fast enough. So a one month window would be extremely good mm. if the asset would be deployed the next day. <laughs> but honestly, this is not how it works. Maybe they will, it will take them two weeks or three weeks to put it, uh, to integrate and put it in the, uh, in the right uh, condition to be deployed. Therefore, sometimes the window of uh, practical uh, usefulness of these things is reduced because after we finish our part of the job, uh, it's not finished. <laughs> uh, there's still some <laughs> steps, uh, before it is, uh, used and these take time. So basically we try to move as fast as possible also because of this, um, inevitable situation where when something is ready, it still takes uh, one week, two weeks, three weeks before it can be um, it can be uh, deployed. So, <clears throat> but luckily, it never happened like the next day. Yeah. That would be that would be really uh, unfortunate. So until now, at least, it never happened. Uh, some other what times the time they like get, now? but some other times they get never patched. So another thing that I showed in the, um, in the ComSec uh, talk is uh, some statistics from our 2019 catalog. Of course, I, I cannot show the latest data, the latest numbers, but I can give as an example, uh, some statistics about our 2019 catalog. Okay, after, at the end of the year, of the 125 intelligence grade exploits that we dealt with during 2019, 93% were still zero day. Whoa. Okay. That's scary. So we are basically saying that for one, one reason or another, uh, 
most of these assets have a quite uh, significant uh, shelf life. Um, so, um, and this is at the same time good and bad <laughs> because uh, it's good because the return on investment from the customer side is extremely high. And it's bad because these customers will not stockpile, uh, or at least they don't do it anymore. They used to do it at the, in the early days, but now they don't uh, stockpile assets. So if they have one or two chains that work, uh, they will not ask for more. It mm. will be a waste of money. Yeah. So, uh, again, this is also an uh, uh, opportunity and uh, uh, a problem. Uh, but in the end, I'm convinced that to help uh, to manage these assets properly uh, and by doing this, extending their shelf life as much as possible is a good plus of our approach uh, of our services um, and of course also the fact that we sell to very few uh, selected customers we don't sell to anyone uh, we don't sell to large numbers of customers which also helps to uh, you know protect uh, the investments made by our customers would you say that of the customers that are that are purchasing these assets, right? Uh, are most of them using it for offensive capability, or are they trying to derive some defensive understanding from it as well? Well, first like, of all, it, you know what I mean. <laughs> what they're using it for? <laughs> but no, first of all, uh, we have some idea of the field of application, but we don't know. Uh, hmm. So the vetting that we do is on the customer, is not on the activity that the customer will perform because, uh, of course, we are not uh, in the position to know. Mm. Um, but this said, sometimes we receive different types of requests. Uh, this is also very interesting and this is also why I'm thinking that uh, some kind of convergence between offensive and defensive activities is needed. Mm. Uh, so sometimes we receive as a request we want to know if our tanks are vulnerable <laughs> to this okay now I'm saying tanks it's just an example it's not maybe tanks but to, to give you an idea or we want to know if our telco or we want to know if so in this case the the, the exploit is used to prepare countermeasures or mitigations. Uh, again, we don't know exactly how and when, but this is certainly the idea behind certain um, purchases. In other cases, it is clearly for offensive purposes. Also, some things are offensive by nature, I mean, there's no way to, to use them for defensive purposes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but I would say that we have both uh, types of requests depending on things that we uh, can only imagine that we don't know, but, uh, you know, um, you know, the the fact that sometimes you can also find collisions, you can find mm. the same bug twice. So sometimes what happens is that there is a, a, an attack and they want to understand how it was done. Mm. And by researching the same class of bugs, we can give them some hints or maybe find again the same bug that was already used against them because honestly uh, and I always say it uh, our visibility on this market is not 100% so 
at this point, after five years, we are in a position to see a lot of what's going on, but not everything. So um, sometimes maybe someone so, has already found the same uh, bug and exploited it, and, and we just don't know. Especially those teams that work exclusively for a certain customer, and you will never know what they have. Uh, unless you find it uh, in your uh, <coughs> in your <coughs> in your uh, networking uh, 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 logs, okay, or you find it, uh, you find that it was used against you. So um, uh, mostly the requests that we receive are for um, purely offensive stuff. And again, as I said previously, very focused on the information gathering and um, for law enforcement and, and for intelligence. So, you know, I mean, I think one of the questions that um, normally comes up when it comes to bug bounty programs uh, is the uh, ethics and the trust side of things, right? So you guys know who your buyers are, but what's stopping them from reselling it? Well, that's a very good question. That's uh, my answer is very simple. We don't work with integrators, mm. <laughs> which is a big loss uh, in terms of potential business. But it's also the only way to make sure that our assets go exactly where we want them to go. Uh, you see, uh, it would be much easier to sell to integrators. There are uh, very interesting companies nowadays which are developing uh, platforms and tools and that could integrate our assets into their, uh, let's call it armory, okay, uh, or set of uh, assets. But uh, of course, we cannot force them to disclose who their customers are. And therefore, we cannot uh, risk that for some reason, something that we uh, developed or that we found and then maybe repackaged, uh, fine-tuned, uh, extended, and so on, because this is what we do. With. Also because, and I hope the researchers will not be offended, uh, a very good researcher often is not also a very good programmer. Hmm. So sometimes the, the, the exploits are super cool, but can be um, significantly improved from a programming point of view. Uh, so uh, we invest a lot and therefore we cannot risk that our assets go in places that we don't want them to go or simply to not know where they go. Um, without any judgment, you know, on, on the fact that these companies have customers from all over the world and not all countries are uh, uh, giving the, the same level of uh, assurance about uh, how they will use these, these assets for many reasons that we don't want to judge. It's just a matter of fact. So, yes, that's my answer. It's very simple. <laughs> we know where these assets go because we don't deal with uh, intermediaries or we don't right. deal with uh, uh, integrators. Hmm. So from the risk management side of things, basically you guys have processes in place in order to make sure that there's some level of guarantee, I guess, to the expert writer that that tool isn't going to fall into quote-unquote wrong hands. You know, there's always that concern, right? Well, you see, this discussion, this topic about what, which are the right hands and the wrong hands is super complicated. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> really, we would need a couple of uh, weekends to discuss about it. <laughs> Uh, with a good bottle of, of wine, because uh, <laughs> it's really complicated. Um, it's not so easy as many people think it is. Uh, so we need to remove as much as possible uh, the, the risks of exposure or liabilities or incidents or 
abuses uh, to the maximum degree possible. Of course, if you are selling uh, uh, sidearms to the police, uh, you sell them uh, 50,000 uh, Beretta pistols. And if there is one crazy policeman that is going to uh, kill an innocent with that Beretta, uh, how can you prevent it? So uh, even if maybe the law enforcement agency overall behaves properly, follow the, follows the rules, and is uh, abiding to, to the laws, uh, you can still have individuals which create problems. And this is something that is unavoidable, I think. But this said, you can choose to sell to a certain law enforcement agency and not to another, uh, your, your, your pistols. Now, I don't like to assimilate exploits to guns because this is, uh, simply not right. It's not a, a useful metaphor. Exploits are not the equivalent of guns in the cyberspace, blah, blah. This is crap. Uh, exploits are pieces of software that do very specific things on very, very few uh, specific targets for a very short time until they don't work anymore. So it's completely different from a gun. But <clears throat> going back to your, to your question, um, the, the risk management is, I would say, 50% of our job. Uh, we are both doing uh, very technical, weird things uh, and ap applying uh, very strict uh, risk management uh, processes from a management and organizational point of view. Also because there are no good regulations in mm. place. So <clears throat> imagine if you are shipping a can of a uh, very toxic thing, uh, there are so many laws, so many checks, and this shipment will be tracked because it's dangerous, toxic, uh, uh, stuff and there will be a certain way uh, which is a standard that must be applied to handle this can uh, to, to move it from here to there to, and so on so on. but for uh, exploits there is nothing like that nobody knows actually the, the dangerousness of what they are dealing with until an incident happens and in so my do you opinion, think that you're going to government actually take absolute. a proactive role in trying to manage this in some way so that everybody plays fairly? So we we found a lot of resistance in in the market to find a new, better um, risk assessment standard. Uh, we tried, but uh, we didn't receive uh, good uh, feedbacks from other players. Customers are interested, but uh, many, uh, at least until now, in the, f in the market are not interested into finding, defining together a way to give a risk score mm. to these things and handle them differently depending on what they are. So if you have something with a and I'm talking about, uh, I'm not talking about the CVSS score, of course, because that is purely technical. Yeah. Okay. But you can have a 9 or a 10 for something that cannot have huge impacts at a society level, uh, while something else with the same CCVS, CVSS, sorry, could have dramatic impacts uh, on society as a whole. So... Uh, we are not there yet, but we really would like to move forward in this direction because also for us as a company, imagine we are a small company 
and we are dealing with things that potentially can be extremely damaging. So we take all possible measures and we really avoid to do a lot of deals because we don't want to generate uh, unnecessary risks or simply to create unpredictable situations where we don't know what's going to happen. That is enough for us to stop a deal. Mm. Many others are not following this kind of approach. And, and I understand it because since there are no regulations, why should they bother? Right. But in perspective, a responsible, I don't want to use the, the word ethical because I don't know. I know many people will, you know, um, be, um, uh, won't be happy if I if I try to say that this is an ethical approach, right? To offensive stuff, it's it's apparently a paradox. Um, so let me just say that from a, a, a risk management point of view, in order to make things happen smoothly, reduce liabilities, reduce unnecessary risks. And overall, having this market work in a sustainable way, uh, we should develop some sort of standard for attributing a risk score to different types and different classes of, of assets. The fact that we don't have this is dangerous. Uh, How long do you think uh, it will so, take before we see this becoming kind of commonplace that everybody kind of agrees that we have a standardized way of describing it or uh, attributing a risk score to it? Yeah. You see, the thing is, this risk score is not, cannot be purely technical because mm -hmm. when we're talking about cyber stuff nowadays, we are talking about something that affects physical and human assets as much as, if not more, technical assets. So, for example, let's say you have a nice exploit for a wearable uh, healthcare device. Now, from the point of view of research, this is super cool, right? But if this ends in the wrong hands, this can be used to kill people, mm. not just to take their uh, emails from their phone. And by the way, also taking emails from the phone can be very dangerous, depending on the situation, right? So, uh, we need to mm, define a multi-dimensional scoring system where the technical, uh, variables are together with the uh, potential impacts in terms of several, uh, things. And, and this should give us uh, uh, some sort of index so that we know what we are dealing with. And we can, uh, we can definitely uh, improve the way we work if we know what are the risks of this stuff. Of course, we have our own uh, internally developed uh, risk assessment uh, framework. Mm -hmm. Uh, because even if there is not a standard, we wanted to have this. So everything we deal with has a score. And I must say from our experience that the fact that we developed this, uh, helps us, uh, a lot in, in our activities and in taking decisions, uh, taking decisions. Sometimes this will go against the business. Is this inevitable? Like every time there is some kind of regulation or self-regulation, you will also lose something. But you will gain more by saving on, on mistakes, errors, consequences, liabilities, and, and, and so on. So, so that's our approach. Our approach, the, and I hope it will slowly spread. <clears throat> in this market, because this is something that we really uh, miss as a community, as a whole, to know more or less what we're talking about in terms of 
potential impacts and act accordingly. Uh, I would say even responsibly, <laughs> if not <laughs> ethically. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I was, I was going to say, like, uh, why don't you guys take the lead? As in, like, since you already have the framework in place that you guys use internally, why not publish it? Publish it as an open doc that uh, everybody can refer to and then say that this is going to be, like, you know... Yes, what this is a, this is a great uh, possibility. We have been thinking about it and... Um, this is one possibility, but you know, I would prefer to find some sort of preliminary agreement with some of the biggest players in this field, review this together, and then after this review, after this discussion, and this uh, fine-tuning, because I'm sure that our framework is not perfect, mm. and then we could together share it with the rest of the of the community for further refinements and for further discussion. Mm. Uh, this is not something that, you know, <clears throat> because this in the end will be some sort of self-regulation. It has to be uh, embraced. It cannot be enforced. Mm. So uh, my hope is to find a, a critical mass of interested parties that want to work on this. And then after this preliminary work, we can share it for further discussion with the community as a whole and receive all the comments, receive all the ideas and, and, and have in the end something that was really shared and therefore can be applied. Uh, so definitely this is something I want to work um, in the next months. Uh, and maybe you, you could also help us to do this. Yeah, for sure. Well, but I mean, I was just going to say, like, you know, if there's any way that you think we can play a small part in helping to make this discussion at least start, uh, we'd be more than happy to. You know, I mean, I can think of Katie Masuris as one person that might have a lot of ideas on how this can be put into some kind of a framework that we can at least have yeah. a reference point to start off from. It's not going to be perfect, but we have to start yeah. somewhere. This is just for having some kind of reference. Mm. Uh, because the fact that we completely um, uh, don't have that, uh, considering the size of this market, the sensitivity of what we do, the applications of what we deal with, it's definitely uh, needed. Mm -hmm. We can we can't wait anymore. I think it's it's about time to to have this kind of reference at least uh, for uh, for taking informed decisions because the zero days are definitely not born equal and they will have different impacts, different effects, different applications, and potentially different adverse effects. <coughs> Excellent, man. Excellent, excellent. Uh, I think we're out of time, brother. We have already just gone past an hour, but... Um, yeah, I know, but we can go on for another six on, hours man. probably without you know, like, <laughs> any problem. This topic is so interesting because but it's, no, uh, fine. it's so, not an easy yes, I topic, hope bro. I answered... Uh, I mean, I tried to answer in the most uh, open and transparent way as, as possible. And I really thank you for, for these questions and for this opportunity to... Uh, discuss things that are usually not discussed openly, which is a pity. Yeah. Uh, I understand the need for uh, confidentiality and, of course, that those are uh, required in our field, but to discuss about the field shouldn't be uh, taboo as it is. It should be The conversations should be open and a wider audience should also contribute. Which is something that we're trying to do, right? So, hopefully, hopefully, this is just a, a little step uh, towards that direction. Well, let's plan for this, bro. Let's plan for for maybe getting together towards later part of the year when things hopefully get a little bit better, and let's see who we Absolutely. can we can put onto a panel of some sort where we can at least start the discussion, right? Because like it's not like we're going to come up with a solution, but. We have to start. We have to start. Yeah, look, we, we don't think we have now. the solutions. We think that we have the questions mm. <laughs> at this point. Yeah. Uh, we have some <laughs> ideas, of course, also, but uh, mostly we have questions and we would like to, to find uh, the answers. Excellent, excellent. 
Thanks, brother. Uh, always good to chat with you, and uh, yeah, always good times to hear your thoughts as well, man. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Dylan, and thanks everybody. See you uh, hopefully in person soon. Bye. We'll see you soon, brother. Bye. Take care, man.